Hey everyone, welcome back to A View from Earth, a science podcast brought to you by the Fisk Planetarium. Uh, every week, we're going to interview a new uh, Colorado based scientist and bring you the work that they're doing, um, and also some of the stuff that is not so obvious. Uh, this week, we're talking with Andrew Novick, who is a time lord. But first, my name is Colin Sinclair. I am a presenter at the Fisk Planetarium when the building is open. Uh, obviously, I co-host this podcast, and I'm an undergrad at CU Boulder. I'm joined today with uh, Tara Tomlinson. Hi, Tara. Hi, Colin. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Tara. I'm a planetary scientist and a CU alum. I'm also a presenter at Fisk, again, when the theater is open, and I help coordinate our outreach program. Cool. And then also, as always, we have uh, John, our producer. Hi, John. Hello. <laughs> John loves being on the camera. That's it. Cool. All right. So yeah, we're talking with Andrew, the Time Lord. So Andrew works at NIST, uh, and he's an electrical engineer for uh, this, which is the, the National Institute of Standards and Time. NIST is the, the institution responsible for setting the time here in the U.S. Um, so Tara, you, how did you find Andrew? Did you know him before this? So Tara is actually the one who, who uh, reached out to Andrew and, and you know, schedule this interview with him. How, how did, th did that happen? I actually did not know him before this, but we have a mutual friend. So a okay. friend that actually I've known for 10 years. <laughs> I feel like I've known her forever, um, like way back from when we were in Austin together. And then I moved here to go to see you. And then she came over just a couple years ago and lives down in Denver. And they are on a floor hockey team together. <laughs> Ah, yes. Of all things. Yes. Um, so yeah, we have that mutual friend and she was like, oh my God, you have to meet this guy. He's so interesting and he does science and you do science, which is how I meet a lot of my science friends, really. Right. Somebody's Naturally. Us together. Um, but yeah, I thought it was super interesting. Um, so yeah, he, he helps maintain the atomic clock, which regulates time for the U.S., which is a big, important thing, apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they say. Knowing what know, time it is, say. you know. Also, I need to correct myself. I just got a text from my roommate who heard me. I misspoke. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, not of Standards and Time. Thanks, Brandon, for that heads up. So um, anyways, just to, just to clear the air there. Um, Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, yeah. We use time for lots of things. For example, we used time to determine when to start this meeting. Um, so that was useful. Um, but we also use time so that our computers could connect to the internet and then this meeting could exist. And Zoom is probably using time to coordinate all three of our video feeds and audio. And John will use time when he, uh, you know, cuts these things together. Um, so time is important. And I, it I struck say. me about halfway through our interview, I was thinking we were talking about how time is different based on like different altitudes and different sources of gravity. Right. And my brain went off on this tangent that was like, if I have a spacecraft at Jupiter, how much different is the time if it's orbiting mm -hmm. and then it's got big gravity, but there's also the sun, like does the Parker Solar Probe measure time differently because it's close to the sun? And, there's a lot of interesting aspects of like the practicalities. Like I get, I can get off on the, you know, the philosophical aspects of sure. what is time and why does time exist and yeah, time doesn't yeah. really exist. Right. But like the practicalities of measuring time is actually super complicated. <laughs> Seriously. Well, that's something that they explore in the movie Interstellar, and this is actually famously exaggerated, right, for cinematic effect. But at one point, you know, they go to this planet that's like right by a black hole. And, you know, they're on this planet and I can't remember the situation, but they're because of that effect, you know, because of relativity, their proximity to this extremely massive object, the black hole, they have, they can spend what to them feels like a couple minutes on this planet, or maybe it's a couple hours doing whatever work they need to do. And when they get back up to their like, you know, spacecraft that they're kind of like traveling through dimensions with you know, they, or space, I guess, uh, they, they get back up and like several years have passed on this spacecraft and even more on earth. And it's just like this whole like cascade of time passing at different times. And it is just like, it's very interesting. 
yeah, my first big introduction to that whole concept was an episode of Stargate SG-1. Nice. Where they la- these, this whole group landed on a planet that was really close to a black hole, but they didn't realize that. And so, like, the people on Earth were looking at him, and it was like they were frozen. Like, time right. was so slowed down that they didn't even look like they were moving. But they were like, but they don't even know that this is happening. Right. It's just, right. like, 17-year-old Tara was freaking out. <laughs> like, this is crazy. Yep. On that note, let's go ahead and jump into our interview with Andrew. We'll see what he has to say about all the cool things about time. So today we are talking with Andrew Novick, who is a Denver-based artist, musician, director, photographer, collector, Casa Bonita connoisseur, and many other things. But he is also an electrical engineer in the Time and Frequency Division of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, here in Boulder. His research examines how we track time and what effects the system might have on things like internet servers, GPS satellites, even world financial markets. So thank you so much for joining us today, Andrew. Cool, thanks for having me. Yeah, we're super stoked to talk about time. So before we get too far into this, let's go ahead and get the easy stuff out of the way. Can you give us kind of a brief overview of what an atomic clock is and kind of how it works? Yeah, sure. Uh, So atomic clocks uh, work with a natural resonance frequency of atoms. And uh, the the huge benefit of atomic clocks is um, because before, whether we used pendulum clocks or quartz crystal clocks, um, or even the stars and the, um, the planetary motion for figuring out time and time synchronization, um, all of those factors have kind of a human aspect to them. Uh, so like if you made a quartz crystal clock, the frequency of that clock depends on how you cut the quartz and the temperature and things like that, or the pendulum, the frequency of the pendulum depends on, um, the length of the arm. And so if you were to make a clock, a pendulum clock, and I were to make a pendulum clock, there's nothing that would say that those would be the same. And so um, using a natural resonance frequency of atoms, we have a huge benefit that anywhere around the world, the resonance frequency of a particular state change of a cesium atom is the same frequency. And so uh, the way that we get that, like get that frequency out of an atom um, is not that the atom is emitting a frequency um, in this case, it's that Uh, a very particular resonance frequency will make an atom change atomic states. So if we want to change between the F3 to the F4 state of an atom, if you remember your orbital chemistry, (laughs) um, there's a very particular frequency so that if you interrogate the atom with that frequency, you, it will change states. And so uh, what we do is generate a, a frequency at, at or around the frequency that we believe will make an atom change state. And we do it to a lot of atoms. So in the case of like a cesium beam tube clock, there's um, you know, billions of atoms streaming by and we, they go through a region where they get interrogated with a frequency. And then we look on the other end to see, did they change state or how many change states? And then we use a feedback electronics to change the frequency to where we get the peak of atoms changing state. And so that frequency is kind of locked to the, um, that resonance frequency of atoms. And so, and usually that frequency comes from, even though like the, the resonance frequency for cesium that we use is on the order of nine gigahertz, nine billion hertz, uh, but that's multiplied up from like a five or 10 megahertz signal. And so what we end up having is a really, really stable five megahertz that comes out of an atomic clock uh, because it's locked to that frequency, that resonance frequency. Um, So you might wonder if that's really, it's not really an atomic clock if it doesn't tell what time it is. It's really an atomic oscillator. the, The output of an atomic clock is not time, it's actually frequency. It's a very, very, very stable frequency. So let me see, let's see if I can summarize this in like really easy terms, but basically you're just 
adding energy to these atoms and they behave in a really predictable way that is very regular and precise. Yeah, think, if, you, if you have the right frequency, you see a change. And so that's what you're looking for. Okay, excellent. So now my question is, how does a, a, a frequency of 9 billion hertz, or you know, the five, uh, five did you say five megahertz is, mm -hmm. is kind of the base for that? How does that turn into human time, right? Because obviously the time that we use as humans you know, like one second, it, like it's, all it is is a fraction of other stuff that is astronomical. But one second by itself, as far as I'm aware, doesn't have any like higher meaning other than that we said, yeah, that's a good amount of time to pass before we say that it has. So how, does, how do you take those oscillations and turn them into, oh, here's how we're going to keep it, you know, keep track of time? Yeah, that's a good, um, that's a good question. And how I usually, like if I do a tour, at NIST, the first thing I do is I show uh, like a pendulum. And the pendulum itself is actually the oscillator, right? So what do you need for a clock? You need something periodic and you need a counter. And so in the case of a pendulum, the, the swinging of the pendulum arm is periodic. And then the counter is the gears. So every time, it, uh, every time the pendulum swings, a gear moves. And uh, there's a gear for minutes and there's a gear for seconds. And, uh, and hours, and so that's what moves the hands. So you really just need a counter to turn frequency into time. And frequency, the, the hertz is just cycles per second. So really one over frequency is time. So if you basically, if you divide the five megahertz by five million, then you have one second. And uh, as you were talking, the second is really, I mean, it's kind of arbitrary, right? It's a human made interval that we, use as a, in a convenient way and really it was it was broken down you know starting with uh the sundial which was round and so when they divided you know they divided the sundial up into degrees and so um you know it used to be a base six system i think it was the ancient sumerians maybe who had a base six system and so in their geometry it was 360 degrees and so you have all these these sixes, and so we have um, uh, we have that's why we have this round clock, and it's divided up, and so we have sixty minutes um, going around the circle, and um, you know that sixty minutes is then sixty divided into sixty seconds, and so that's a it's a it's you know fairly arbitrary in the sense that we could come up with a new unit of time that's entirely different as long as it's uh, the same and realizable, you know, by everyone around the world. Okay, so, so moving on, NIST is listed as the inventor of the atomic clock, right? Right, yeah, finger quotes there, air quotes, is the inventor of the atomic clock. But there are several all over the world, and you also mentioned GPS, right? There are, I mean, there are atomic clocks and satellites in space, right? Are all of these clocks independent from one another? or do they somehow synchronize and talk with each other? Um, and I guess another way to ask this question is, is there a master clock somewhere? Yeah, um, there's a lot of questions in that, <laughs> in your one question, there's a lot of questions. Um, the, there was actually a, an Irish um, physicist in the late 1800s that kind of came up with the idea for it, um, that frequency that atoms have um, natural, uh, what they called vibrations in, in that, in that era. Um, and that if you could figure out that vibration, you could have, you know, some kind of stable time source. Um, and that was James Clark. Uh, but it's true that the first atomic clock, um, was first working atomic clock was developed by Harold Lyons, um, who worked with NIST, for NIST at the time. Um, in the 30s, and later, because later it was or it was named NBS One. Um, NIST used to be called National Bureau of Standards uh, up until the late 80s. I actually worked there as a student when I was going to CU. Uh, it was my work study job, and so so I've just never left since the late 80s. Uh, but it was called NBS at the time, and uh, it became NIST I think in 1988. And so, 
uh, if, like I was saying before, if, if two of us or all of us came up with uh, a frequency from uh, the same kind of atom, theoretically, we would all have the same frequency. And so um, because time is defined by a particular resonant frequency of cesium, if you can make a clock that, that exploits that resonant frequency or locks to that resonant frequency of cesium, in the sense you have, I mean, you have what we call a primary standard, a standard that gets its time directly from the atomic resonance. And we would all have the same um, time or time interval. So, the, so it really is the definition of the second. But that said, uh, different atomic clocks run at slightly different rates uh, based on um, something like temperature or the number of atoms. Like if you start running out of atoms in your cesium tube, um, you might uh, have a less stable or uh, a, drifting, uh, a drifting time. <clears throat> and time also runs differently at different altitudes. So we can talk about, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but uh, as far as a master clock or a master time, um, we have at NIST what we call the primary standard for the United States. That's the NIST um, F2 or NIST F1. We have these uh, atomic fountain clocks that work different than a beam tube clock. But those that, those, so those are the primary standard for the United States. And then there's other labs that ha also have uh, cesium standards. Um, but a lot of countries around the world have a primary standard. And we all do inner comparisons uh, which uh, is all stored um, and kind of um, analyzed and archived at the Bureau of International Measurements, the BIPM in France. And so since we all submit our time data uh, and data comparisons with all sorts of, uh, with a bunch of different countries, they come up with coordinated universal time. And that's the official, like the time, coordinated universal time. Uh, and then they publish a, a report called the Circular T, and that basically says how far off everybody was from that uh, official time, and it's a weighted average. So it's mathematically weighted based on um, this, uh, the most stable clocks, and also the clocks that are closest to the average get the most weight. So that way, if, if uh, a clock is drifting or a, a country has a problem with their clock, it doesn't pull the average equally. It, it has less and less weight as it gets farther away from the average. But that said, it's not a clock then. <laughs> it's, a, it's an equation. So the official coordinating universal time is really, it's a, it's, a, it's a mathematical equation. It's not an actual clock. So I'm gonna do something that I don't think we've ever done here on a view from Earth. And that is, I'm gonna share my screen. And this isn't important for audio only listeners, but here I have pulled up time.gov. And at home, if you're just listening, you can go to time.gov. And this is the <laughs> official US time. And it's this cool page and it shows you what the time is in all these different spots. First of all, what I've noticed is that, you know, so these, these, all these different time zones are, are ticking at the same time, right? So like, you know, it's it, everywhere, it's six seconds. And then, you know, the hours and minutes, you know, differ by time zone, well, actually just the hours. Anyways, my seconds on my clock on my computer are like one and a half seconds behind what's ticking on this website. And so that's interesting. And I wonder, Andrew, if you know how this website is synchronized to display on my computer here in Boulder, because obviously there's latency, right? And how I'm connecting to the internet and how this is uploaded and then how my computer processes it and displays it. So is there a way that, that time.gov synchronizes so that it, this is exact or is there some uncertainty? Obviously there's some, is there significant uncertainty in how this is being displayed and also on my computer clock by itself? Um, yes, the answer is yes, I do know because I wrote it. So. Oh, great, <laughs> of course. Um, but we've been doing this at NIST for quite a lo long time, you know, early internet years in the 90s, um, we started making web clocks and figuring out a way to display accurate time at a remote place. And so um, 
how we do it is kind of crafty. We actually use your computer's oscillator, your internal oscillator of your computer, um, to measure uh, the latency. Huh. So in other words, when you pull up that page, um, you know, it brings in the graphics and everything. Once everything's kind of loaded, it says, okay, we're going to go get a timestamp. So what time is it? It looks at your computer and the um, um, microsecond resolution and makes a time tag just in the browser software. But then it goes to our server, our accurate server, our uh, times, one of our time servers, and gets a, an accurate time stamp and then comes back. And when you get that time stamp back, you say, okay, what time is it now? And you see how many, um, how many microseconds have passed. So then we say, okay, we're gonna display the time in whatever time zone, um, but we're going to be, but be, what the time that we got is late by one, the one way um, latency from our server to your computer. Right. And so your computer knows, um, your measurement is the round trip delay, when you made the request and when you got the timestamp back. Sure. And so the uncertainty is in what's the one way transmission. And so okay. we estimate it as just half the round trip. Right. Because there's really, we have no way of knowing, um, you know, did you have to wait, um, you know, that was there some step uh, that you had to wait in, in some um, server or in some uh, right. switching situation. Um, so we can only really estimate it as half the round trip delay. Okay. Um, but what we're showing is, um, you know, I would say it's, it's millisecond accuracy at least, or yeah. a couple hundred milliseconds. Um, and your computer clock sets itself periodically, usually, I mean, in, in most operating systems, they set themselves periodically um, to a time server, whether it's at, it could be at Microsoft, it could be at NIST. You can actually set a Windows computer to look at one of the NIST servers. Huh. And um, if, uh, and, some, and some computer clocks uh, or some operating systems actually adjust, if, so if they, the problem with like Windows is it only checks once a week as the default. And computer clocks are inherently bad, right? So once a week's not often enough. But when it checks uh, and it says, okay, here's how far off I, uh, uh, my clock was from the time that I just got from the time server, and that could be 3.5 seconds or whatever. It could be pretty big. Um, so it makes, a, it makes a, a time step. It sets the clock. But also, it can actually adjust the, the computer's oscillator um, this says, oh, well, every time I do this, I'm fast by three seconds a week. So I'm actually going to adjust the oscillator to be slower. And so over a long period of time, your computer can actually get better because it's, it's using the offset as um, you know, data to make, a, uh, make a, an adjustment. And is time.gov used you know, for the purpose of us going to it and looking at it and kind of appreciating what's going on? Or does time.gov act as, you know, uh, like, does it have another purpose, you know, that isn't just for, you know, the standard citizen to go look at time? It literally is just a time of day clock. We, we put that in our category of just time of day. Um, it's not used for measurements. There's actually a disclaimer in the about section to not to use it for measurements. And the reason is it only checks in with our server periodically. So when you go to the page, it gets that timestamp. But the running clock is actually just, it's your computer oscillator. It's taking the right time versus like your computer clock, which might be one and a half seconds off. Um, but it's looking at the right time, but it's actually updating itself at the rate of your computer's oscillator. And so you're not really getting each timestamp from NIST. Um, if you call NIST for the time, um, you, what you hear is a simulcast of our, uh, our HF radio um, so we have radio station in Fort Collins, Colorado, and um, one in Kauai, in Hawaii. And those are um, high frequency broadcast stations. So you could actually tune a shortwave dial in and you hear um, time announcements at the top of every minute, as well as um, ticks. You hear audio ticks. Um, so you can actually synchronize a clock um, with, a, with radio. And in Fort Collins, there's actually a low frequency radio signal. Um, and that actually, there's, there's clocks that you can buy. You might have seen them at um, Target or somewhere. That's, it says atomic clock, and it's a, it's a battery powered wall clock. And um, those are uh, 
low frequency 60 kilohertz radio signals from Fort Collins that covers the whole the continental US and, and sometimes further. And they set themselves once or twice a day. Um, and there's actually watches you can get too that set themselves multiple times a day. And so there again, those, those kind of clocks, they set themselves and then they're just running on their quartz crystal the rest of the day until the next night when they set themselves. So um, it's, it's much more efficient to set it periodically than to be you know, running that radio part all the time. You'll run your batteries down. Um, but the, the high frequency stations in Fort Collins in Hawaii are actually, um, were used a lot for calibrating equipment, calibrating radio equipment. In other words, if you have a shortwave radio and you tune it in to five megahertz, uh, you know, your, your radio has a quartz crystal inside, which is getting off in frequency over the years that you have it. Um, and so uh, you're looking, say you tune it to five megahertz and you hear the NIST station, which is goes 2.5 megahertz, 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25 megahertz. So you can catch the, the station on all those different frequencies. Um, but it might look to you that you're, you know, if say you had a digital readout and you were like, you know, 5 million and 10 hertz, um, you know that this, the broadcast frequency comes from atomic clocks. So we are broadcasting on 5 megahertz, no, um, no question, you know. So your, uh, your radio has gotten off in frequency. So it looks like if you're tuned into 5 million and 10 hertz, you're really getting the, the 5 megahertz signal. So you can actually adjust your dial um, to be, you know, you could tune it in to where you hear the station the best and then say that's five megahertz. And so people actually use it for calibrations. Um, and also uh, you could use it to calibrate stopwatches. And so the difference between time.gov and um, the NIST WWV or WWVH, those are the call letters for the high frequency stations. If you listen to it on shortwave or you call it on the phone, you're hearing the same thing. Um, but you get every tick comes from NIST because you're, you're listening to it and it's broadcast. And so um, if you were going to calibrate a stopwatch, you could listen on the phone or on your shortwave and you start the stopwatch. And then several minutes later, you know, at the top of a minute, you stop the stopwatch. Um, and you can see how, um, how far off your stopwatch is. You might be over the course of several hours, you might be a few seconds off. And so, you know, is that within your um, calibration range uh, of, a, you know, what you would deem w within tolerance for your stopwatch? These all sound like super fun little experiments that I want to go and try. Like, I'm just yeah. going to waste my whole day, like, synchronizing my phone. <laughs> So you mentioned a second ago, this is going to be my next question too, the, the philosophical aspects of how we keep time. And I think we could probably do like an entire hour long interview just about this one bit. And I find this fascinating, but I mean, you've, you've done some actual like research and published papers on how we measure time and its social and kind of psychological implications. Is this something that you thought about before working at an atomic clock or is this something that like came with the job that you just kind of fell into? I think, um, I don't know. I've always been interested in the brain, I guess, as just a, a tool and kind of an interesting thing we don't know a lot about. Um, I'm interested in sleep and sleep patterns, um, neural networks, things like that. I probably didn't have a lot of interest in time, you know, per se until starting work at, at NIST or NBS at the time. But uh, um, yeah, I, I find it interesting because um, it, it's something that it's, it's very determinate, right? Like you can find out exactly what time it is. Uh, and so, you know, it's like if I get somewhere and I'm late, people are like, what, you're always late and you work at the atomic clock. Like how you, you should always be on time. So <laughs> it's like, Oh yeah, I, I, I'm late, but I know exactly how late I am. You know, you said I was three minutes late, but I'm only really one minute and 44 seconds late. So <laughs> I know how late I am, but uh, I think it's, it's the kind of relative aspects of time and not relativity, which is another thing we, I hope we can talk about, but uh, kind of your perception of time. And it's like, if someone's like, Oh, I don't have, I don't have time to do that. I got to be somewhere in 20 minutes. And I'll be like, 
oh, I have to be somewhere in 20 minutes. I can do three things before then, you know? And so something like deadlines actually, actually increases my productivity. Uh, and so it's amazing how much you can do if you have to. Uh, and so I kind of, uh, you know, toy with those kinds of things um, with deadlines or, um, you know, trying to squeeze in as much as I can because I, I try to live life to its fullest, I guess. Um, but also the, your, the per, your perception of time, you know, sometimes it's like, man, it's been a long day, <laughs> you know? And it's like, well, it's the same length of, of day as yesterday, but it's like just whatever you were doing really slowed down your perception of time. Um, and I like staying up really late whenever I can because I feel like I can, I get a longer day you know, a longer day, but a longer waking hours. Um, so I can do more. Uh, and, you know, they say, uh, like, the, the longest day of the year, or the shortest day of the year, um, based on, you know, where the sun is and the, um, the solstices, um, which we just crossed the, um, the spring equin or the fall equinox. Um, where the length of the day, uh, and the, you know, lightness and darkness are the same. And so, uh, but like on the solstice where it's the shortest day of the year, it's really the shortest amount of daylight a year. But perception wise, it really is kind of a shorter day because you're like, oh, it's dark at 5.30, you know, it's like, it's already nighttime. And it's like, it's kind of quashing your, um, you know, your daytime thinking. And so even though, you know, I always say, well, it's not the shortest day of the year, all the days are the same um, duration, but, you know, psychologically, it really does change your perception. And also your perception changes with age. Uh, you know, a week is forever when you're a teenager, you know, you're like, man, I wish it was the weekend. It's like, you know, it's taking a long time, but like, as you get older, it's like, I'm, I'm already thinking about like, it's Sunday night. I'm already thinking about like, Oh, I got to take out my trash on Thursday. It's like that's coming up pretty quickly. You know, so time actually um, moves kind of faster as you get older. Um, and I guess, I mean, the, the research that I've done is it kind of has to do with um, the percentage of that time of, compared to your whole lifetime. You know, a week or even a year, if you're 50, is um, much, a much uh, smaller uh, ratio, you know, in a ratio to the amount of time you've been alive than it is if you're 12. You know, that's like a 12th of your life to get to your next birthday. Um, but it's only one 50th of my life if I ha have to get to another birthday and I'm 50. So um, those kinds of uh, kind of thoughts about the passage of time, I, f I find pretty interesting. So, uh, so we mentioned earlier the, you know, we were talking about the relativity of time from a psychological aspect just now, right? How does time pass differently, you know, based on who you are and what you're doing. Now I'm going to ask how time passes differently based on where you are or how fast you're going. Uh, you are probably one of the only people that has to worry about something like relativity in your everyday life. Uh, can you give us just a, a general idea of how general and special relativity fit into accurate timekeeping? Yeah, so, so in the sense of general relativity, uh, clocks move uh, different with gravity. So closer to a large mass, you have some gravity, like the, the gravity of Earth. And so clocks run slower as they're closer to Earth and faster as they get farther away from Earth due to gravity. And so that's general relativity. So the time, say, in space or the time on a satellite um, the clock on a satellite is actually running faster, um, you know, from our, from our frame of reference. Uh, but then also a clock that's moving because of time dilation. Um, <clears throat> so a moving clock, so a clock on, say, clock on a spaceship that's moving away from Earth or moving um, also on a satellite um, is, is moving faster. And so you have, um, or no, moving clock moves slower um, from the frame of reference of someone, uh, an outside observer. So if you're looking, if you're on Earth and you're looking at someone's spaceship clock, it looks like their clock is moving slower compared to your clock. 
But if they look at your clock with their space telescope, it looks like your clock is moving slower compared to theirs. And so that's that relative difference of um, who's moving them or you, you know, it depends on your frame of reference. Um, and so, uh, but those things come into play, especially more, more so with gravity. Um, and so in general relativity in the case of us, because a clock in Boulder, Colorado, like our primary standard is we're gonna run at a different rate as a clock on the East Coast, you know, at um, close to the, um, uh, close to the, uh, you know, the uh, zero elevation. And so we actually have to adjust for that in our measurements. The good thing, thanks to Einstein, uh, is it's very calculatable. Um, it's very predictable, that difference. So we can make that determination very, very um, easily. And in the, I believe in the 80s, they used commercial atomic clocks to actually kind of prove relativity, um, where they put, they synchronized atomic clocks and they put one on a Concorde jet and they, um, you know, flew it. Um, or I don't know if they went around the world or they just flew it around as fast as they could and back. And they, and then they um, measured the clocks and they saw that actually the, the one moved um, less, the one that, the one that traveled moved less relative to the one that was on earth. And so when, cause it came back to our frame of reference, right? Um, so with relativity, you have to decide who's the kind of the base frame. And so, um, and that has, so that had to do with a moving clock and acceleration. Uh, and the other way of looking at it is um, if you have, if you have a running clock and you actually change its altitude, uh, does it change in frequency? And you need a really, really, really good clock to do that. But we ha actually have those. So some of our um, kind of our, you know, our future research um, or our research for future standards, uh, those ion clocks, those kind of quantum level trapped ions, um, those are so stable that we can actually see a difference. So um, they took a, a and, and these are these are big experiments, right? It's not a clock like an atomic clock, an 80 pound thing. It's like on a laser table. It might be on a few laser tables and there's all these optics and, um, and magnetic traps and things. And so, but they took, a, they took a, a stable running ion clock and they moved the laser table by uh, 18 centimeters. And they could see a frequency change that was um, um, re relative, you know, it, it changed um, with the significance of Einstein's relativity. So our clocks are good enough to where we can actually see um, the frequency change based on the, the change, slight change in gravity. And so we actually have uh, gravity measurements done in our labs um, because you, know, you can measure altitude, height from the geoid, but really you wanna measure gravity because there's actually gravity um, uh, kind of, I don't know if they call it gravity wells or whatever, but um, something, two things at the same apparent altitude can actually have different amounts of gravity based on what's underneath. That's super cool. I have like a bazillion questions about that, but we got to keep moving <laughs> because obviously like we here, we're super in, we're space centric. I do, you know, a lot of satellite observations and stuff. And so we worry about stuff like satellites and spacecraft, but I assume that there are plenty of other industries that rely on atomic clocks and things like that. Um, I would say, well, the first thing that let's talk about for satellites is the fact that, um, you know, since we're, we're kind of coming off of the relativity discussion, um, I don't know, do you guys know how GPS works? Is that, is that, is that interesting? I know, I know it has something to do with relativity. I don't, I'm not. It, well, it, has, it has a lot to do with <laughs> atomic clocks. So that's, so how GPS itself works is based on atomic clocks. So you have these um, you know, uh, space qualified clocks on board all of the GPS satellites, and those are all synchronized with each other. And so how you find out your location, your coordinates um, from GPS is because all of those clocks are very well synchronized and the position of each satellite uh, is very well known. And so a satellite broadcasts a message. Uh, there's all sorts of things in the message, you know, which satellite it is and where it is, the most important things. And they, um, 
they give these bursts of data uh, that when you receive, you get, you get some data from satellite 24. And um, satellite 29 broadcast a, a, a packet of data at the exact same time, you know, within a few nanoseconds. Um, but you receive them at slightly different, you know, in uh, some order. So if you're looking at several satellites in, in the sky, they all sent you something at the same time. You receive something slightly sooner from the one that's overhead, the one that's closer to you. And so um, if you know where all of these things are broadcasting from and the order that they came in, that's how you determine your position using GPS. And the only way that that works at all is from the synchronization of the atomic clocks on board. And so uh, you couldn't have GPS without atomic clocks. So you have to have, um, or really any, any kind of navigation, you have to have a good time, um, uh, a good and synchronized stations so that you can determine where you are based on the station, your distance from the station based on how long it took the signal to get there. Um, but because, clock, because satellites are moving, um, there's a pretty big relativistic effect um, from satellites. And you, ha you have that special relativity and the general relativity um, that come into play there. And so uh, it ends up being about 37 or th it's like 37.7 microseconds um, different because of um, adding the general and special relativity. Uh, and so there's a really big correction. Like, you know, we're talking about we need, we need to accurate within a few nanoseconds to have a good position. But because the clock's moving and it's uh, less gravity than on Earth, uh, you're really looking at a huge difference if it's 45 microseconds versus nanoseconds. So relativity comes into play um, very significantly when looking at satellite clocks. Uh, but so satellites um, in general are... Um, you know, we, we actually use the atomic clocks on board satellites to do remote uh, calibrations. So if I, if I have, you know, the NIST, official NIST, UTC NIST, and I compare that to a satellite and somebody else compares whatever their standard is, so say like a private company that's a, a manufacturer um, or another lab, they can compare their clock to the same satellite to, at the same time. And then we compare our data. And so we can actually, um, I, can, I know the difference between NIST and a, a remote lab based on their satellite data when we're both looking at the exact same satellite at the exact same time. It's called common view GPS measurements or time. And so it's, it's actually very useful that GPS is based on atomic clocks. Um, as far as the use and industries um, that use time, so like a long distance telescope, um, something if we if we can predict a, a far off planet it's going to be in a certain place at a certain time uh, the the operator of the telescope needs to know you know a pretty pretty good approximation of the of what time it is to in order to know where to point because you know things are it's really um, uh, fine tuning um, to look you know that far out and expect to see something um, you know based on time and also like any kind of radio communications, um, synchronization, power, uh, power grids need to be synchronized with each other. Um, so you have those kinds of industries uh, as well as electronic equipment and um, any kind of almost, almost uh, I'd say most of the SI units are actually based on the second. And so you have, so the SI units it's standard international units. You have the Volt, the Candela, um, the Second, um, uh, the Meter, uh, and so um, so all of these SI units you have. So NIST, that's what NIST does as the National Institute of Standards, um, is we realize all of those standards for the United States. Um, but the Second is um, has the lowest uncertainty of all of those um, of those standard units. And so, um, so time is actually used in measuring the meter. Uh, and so, you know, the meter used to be this platinum uridium rod that, you know, was a meter long, but you'd have to take it to France and compare the United States meter with the French standard meter and all the countries could compare. 
uh, but due to some uh, laser measurements and um, research done at NIST, the definition of the meter was changed to be related to a wavelength of light because we could determine the second so good, so well. So um, if we can use the second or frequency um, in this case to measure a meter, then that's much better. And then you don't have this physical thing that you have to go take somewhere. You know, and they just redefined the kilogram as well. That was not, that was the last um, uh, artifact standard. So it was an actual kilogram that you would take and compare to another kilogram. Um, something like financial transactions, you know, when you have millions of, of stock trades going on every second um, and high speed trading, um, a lot of the high speed traders, you know, they want to know exactly what time it is and they want to, they want to be closest to the data center and, you know, measure the, the fiber, optical fiber and stuff like that. And so um, we actually have a lot of, uh, we have some of our remote um, steered clocks. We actually have, we, we can actually put a clock in another lab somewhere and steer it to NIST um, and it's within plus or minus 10 nanoseconds. And so a lot of stock market data centers around the world have our um, our steered clocks in them because that's where time is also important. Well, uh, so we did this thing, Andrew, called Capcom Q&A, where people can submit questions to us about a given subject, and then we will then forward those questions on to our experts like you. So we have a couple questions about time. And so these are questions from people uh, that are not Tara and I, uh, who are, you know, curious about time. So uh, we'll go ahead and start with a question from Joe from Fort Worth, who asks, if you changed the time ahead or back by any amount, what would happen? <laughs> uh, that, it's... In some sense, time is really just an agreed upon thing. In other words, if I just changed... UTC NIST, right? Like a lot of people who aren't directly related to UTC NIST wouldn't even see it, right? And it's also, Joe didn't mention how far off, how far are we changing time? Is it 10 seconds or is it, you know, a um, thousand seconds? Uh, so because it's just an agreement, um, in some sense, someone could say, well, these two clocks are different. Like my clock, which was running independently of, of NIST, like my watch, uh, is different than from NIST, so who's right? And so it brings up like, it's, 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 a, it's quizzical, right? It's like, what happened? What's going on? Um, if you change time, say within the stock market, now you're talking about like legal wranglings that would probably go on for years, right? Like, well, I bought that stock before you. No, your clock was wrong. I bought it, my time tag says this, you know? So um, if you change the time of a, a, a power station, you know, they're, they're not going to be in phase with the other power stations and you could have an accident. You could have, it could go offline very quickly and uh, have a cause a blackout. Um, so it really, it really depends a lot on how you changed it and what, what that really means. Um, if you somehow could stop time or change, you know, like freeze, you know, in the science fiction sense, um, or even go backwards in time. So now you're talking about like reliving the same moments that you did or finding yourself uh, as, as a child or whatever, those kind of rifts in time. Um, you know, those are a much unknowns because it's not <laughs> probably really possible. But uh, I would say in some sense, you could, you could even shut off NIST and still the world will still be, be going um, for a little while be before the dependence kicks in. There's a lot of clocks that, you know, synchronize to us once a day or um, once an hour, or if we have a steered clock and it, you, and it loses um, its, our, our digital link that we're steering it, it's actually running, you know, our remote steered clocks are rubidium or cesium oscillators. So it's not gonna get very far off and hopefully long enough to where we get our, get our control back. And so I would say probably in a lot of senses, changing time probably wouldn't have a huge effect if it was, if it didn't last for very long. Thanks so Joe next... for that. <laughs> <laughs> so our next question comes from Charlotte in Austin, and this is going back to the relativity thing again. She says in the documentary about Scott Kelly, who was an astronaut who spent a year on the space station, 
um, his brother mentions that he has a twin brother and he says that one of them is now half a millisecond older than the other one. So can you explain this without, and then she put mind blowing emoji at the end. <laughs> <laughs> without mind blowing emoji. Uh, so yeah, so that has to do with that relativity of a moving clock. Um, and so it's a pretty classic, it's called the twin paradox. So if you have two twins or two clocks, either one that are, so twins happen to be synchronized, right? Because they're the exact same age, or you could synchronize two clocks. And so if a twin goes and travels and um, like the space station is not a great example because it's, it's not that far away and current, current space travel technology, we're not going that fast, right? There's, there's a fair amount of acceleration that to, to get out of the atmosphere or whatever. Um, but the classic twin paradox is where it's, the one twin goes at like 0.7 C, right? So he's going at like 0.7 the speed, times the speed of light. Um, so then you, it's much more significant. And he goes and he's gone um, for what he says is uh, six years. And when he comes back, he's actually been gone for 10 years. So his twin, so he's like much younger than, he's much older than his twin. No, 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 sorry. He's much younger than his twin. Um, and so, because uh, it seems like he's been gone for 10 years. So his twin on earth has aged 10 years and he's only aged six years. Um, and so uh, it has to, I mean, you really have to get to a, a, a significant, um, uh, amount of travel, either be gone for a long time or um, have a significant acceleration for that to play in. But that person with the space station, it's true that the, the, the twin who was on the space station is slightly younger when they come back. When they're there, the relativity, you're, you're still in two different frames. Um, but, when he, but when he comes back is when it's kind of deterministic that he is actually younger, slightly. And Charlotte, I'll throw in, there's a book that I read a couple of years ago called The Order of Time by a guy named Carlo Ravelli, who is an Italian theoretical physicist. It's a quick read. It's not like a technically heavy book. Um, and it, it kind of, you know, puts a lot of these examples together in a way that kind of almost makes it make sense. There's still that part where you're like, wait, back up. That's something's weird. But you can kind of start to wrap your mind around it a little bit more. So that's kind of a cool thing if you're looking to really dig in. Um, okay, Andrew, our last question from uh, Stephanie in Denver is, why is daylight savings time still relevant? <laughs> I feel like we've all asked that question. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe me, I get the emails. Uh, I get emails, you know, people like, why don't you guys get rid of this or whatever? And even though we are the official source of time, we, we deal in UTC, so... UTC NIST is really um, uh, the time in the zero time zone. Like NIST doesn't really have a lot to do with time zones per se. And daylight saving time, which it is saving time, not savings time, um, but that's common, common misuse. Uh, so, and, and NIST is not a regulatory agency. So there's nothing that NIST could do to change that. Um, but that said, it's legislative. And so actually in, 2005, I think, uh, they actually changed the dates of when daylight saving time is. So actually daylight saving time is longer. Um, and there's been studies on, does it really save energy? You know, maybe in the, in the 50s or 60s, it saved energy because people don't use lights, um, you know, as much because they've, their, their time of day has changed um, in the winter. Um, and so, uh, the amount of energy to one person that's, I think those studies show that the amount of energy, like you, would, you wouldn't save that much money on your energy bill over years. Um, but as a country, maybe cumulatively, it does save some energy. Um, nowadays, I'm not so sure. Uh, I haven't seen a recent study about it. Um, but really it's, it, it just would be really hard to change. <laughs> I think it's, it's probably, it's much easier to keep it the same than it is to change it. Um, some countries who don't, don't follow it at all, um, some kind, I'm on a, a, an email list where um, I get changes to daylight saving time rules in different countries. Some countries switch it on and off, like 
you know, from year to year. It's like, no, we're not doing daylight saving time this year. And then it's like, oh, we're changing the dates. Like starting tomorrow, it's going to be daylight saving time, you know, like crazy changes. And so we, I think in general, we try to keep things the same. But I mean, if you wrote to your uh, local legislators and statewide legislators, um, there's, uh, there's bills that come up every couple years um, uh, in Congress to either alleviate daylight saving time or as I would prefer going on daylight saving time all the time. Cause I really like daylight saving time better, right? I'm a, I'm a night person. Uh, I don't care what's going on in the morning, right? right? But like, I like it when it's lighter out for longer. So daylight saving time is kind of my more favorite time of year. So um, there's definitely questions about that. If you got rid of it, then you wouldn't have those longer, longer summer days, you know, days with, you would have the natural longer daylight, but you don't get that extra hour of daylight. And really, I mean, is it, I know people say it affects them for, for days or weeks, right? Like, oh, I'm still tired from daylight saving time. But, but we're like, we usually typically go to bed and wake up at different times of day all the time. You know, I, the time, the time that I go to bed could be any time between like 1130 and 330 AM and same with waking up. And so really that's the, the, the swing that I have in my normal day to day when I sleep and when I um, I'm awake is varied like much more significantly than daily saving time. So it doesn't seem to, I don't think it really affects me that much. I love the idea that think? people send you emails to complain about time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Sometimes people have like, I've, I came up with a new calendar. It's much better than our existing calendar. It's like, that's probably true. But there again, it's like all of these things is just something that we all agree on, right? We agree on the Gregorian calendar seems to work. We have leap days and whatever. And uh, it just would be really hard to change, you know, and, and especially like say something like the definition of the second or the, or the ca changing the calendar, um, where it's an international agreement, how are you gonna get all of these countries around the world to change? I mean, it's like, it's, it's kind of nice that we all do agree on standards, you know, internationally. It's one thing that we kind of can agree on, but to change it, I think it's gonna, that is, is really hard to, to get everyone to agree to change. Cool. Well, uh, Andrew, I think that, that puts us right about at our time. So uh, thanks so much for joining us today and telling us all about time. I learned a lot. <laughs> this is very interesting stuff. So we really appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem. I'm uh, glad to be here and it's uh, been fun talking to you all. All right, we wanna thank Andrew again for joining us today. That was a super fascinating conversation about time. Everybody be sure to come back next week. We're going to be talking to a gentleman. He's a professor here at CU. His name is Dr. Larry Esposito. He is going to be telling us all about potential missions to Venus. Now, this should be super interesting considering all of the new uh, revelations that we've just come across about Venus and its atmosphere and some of the weird chemistry that's happening there. So definitely come back next week to check out our interview with Dr. Esposito. In the meantime, we also want to invite you to uh, go to our website, colorado.edu slash FISC. There you can see the schedule of all of our upcoming shows and guests. There's also an option for you to submit questions for our experts to answer on the episode. So if you want to know more about this weird phosphine discovery on Venus, jump on there and shoot us a question and we'll ask Dr. Esposito live on the air. You can also send us an email if you have any questions to FISC podcast at colorado.edu. Um, on our website, there's also an option to donate. So if you would like to see our podcast continue into the future, just as much as we would love to bring it to you, uh, feel free to jump on there and uh, throw us a you know, cup of coffee or something our way. And be sure to uh, like and subscribe and do everything you need to do on your platform to make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. We're available on YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And you can also get to us right from our website as well. So thanks again, everybody, and we hope to see you next week.